is Nick Diaz, who will be telling us about Iriophilum lanatum uh, in a polyploid contact zone. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name, as she said, my name is Nick, and I'm presenting the work that I've been doing in my first year of my PhD, uh, and sort of getting, getting you guys familiar with what I'm thinking about and what I've been working on. So I'll jump right in to Iriophilum lanatum. This is my study system. It has a very wide range. Um, and, is, and exhibits extensive morphological variability throughout this range, particularly in its leaves. Uh, this species complex has drawn the attention of Lincoln Constance, Carl Quist, and most recently, John Mooring um, from Santa Clara University. Uh, through John Mooring's study geographic work, um, we now know that there are 12 geographically delineated varieties, uh, but that there are also tetraploid and hexaploid uh, populations throughout the range. These tetraploid and, pop and hexaploid populations occur more frequently where these 12, where each of the varieties meet at the interfaces of their ranges. This taxonomic confusion um, has been understandable. There have been 75 binomials and trinomials used in Iriophilum linatum alone. Uh, in Iriophilum, there have been even more. It is a very messy group. Um, from John Mooring's uh, greenhouse work, we know that self incompatibility approaches 99%. Um, but that the reproductive barriers between diploid crosses of different varieties are higher than uh, crosses between tetraploid individuals of the same varieties as well. Uh, throughout John's work, um, he, or during John's work, he was particularly perplexed by a region in southern Oregon, which I've designated with this red circle. This is an area at the interfaces of the ranges of two varieties, uh, variety Achilleoides and variety Leucophyllum. Uh, in this area, he has detected um, individuals that are morphologically intermediate at the diploid, tetraploid, and hexaploid level. Um, but when you're in this region, it's almost impossible to ID down to variety, um, and the variability is incredible, really incredible. Uh, there are a few characters um, that he has published on that he says distinguishes the two varieties. These sometimes hold true, but not always, but I think they are worth mentioning. Uh, the first is that is the root system. Um, Achilleoides has a is tap rooted and slight, where Leucophyllum is fibrous and massive. Uh, it also has to do with their forms. Um, one grows in single individuals; the other is clumped, uh, and their lifespans are actually different as well. Uh, and there have been several transitions in Iriophyllum between perennially and annually, uh, but these two um, really don't stick to anything, um, as far as I can tell, and as far as he can tell. Um, sorry. Um, despite what he found in this area with the hexaploids and the tetraploids, he could find no relationship between environmental correlates um, and the distribution of them. Even geographic distance didn't make sense. And so he suggested that polyploidy is mainly stabilizing hybridization between these varieties. Um, but I don't think it necessarily ends there. Uh, I found his work uh, really inspiring, um, and I really wanted to keep working in this area. Uh, so the first thing that I thought I should do was to revisit some of these populations. And based on his really nice figure here, you'd think that these were based on GPS coordinates, but they're not. Um, I have reached out to John, and I'm actually in correspondence with him still. Um, and he informed me that he didn't have a GPS at the time, and he made photocopies of his field notes and then mailed them to my home address. <laughs> I brought them in and got on Google Earth and attempted to georeference his populations based on his descriptions, such as this is half a mile south of the post office in this town. Sometimes that post office doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that's been a really fruitful um, exchange, and I, I hope to keep talking with him. But you'll see why sampling these populations matters in just a bit. To take a step back, uh, I just want to talk about the aims for the work I'm presenting today. It was to investigate the distribution of cytotypes across these populations to understand their structure and connectivity, and to determine what landscape features or what environmental features might be influencing the gene flow and dispersal in this range. My methods include plastid population genomics. Uh, my lab at Portland State has uh, designed a targeted capture, and we do a de novo whole chloroplast genome assembly. That was done by Jessica Persinger in my lab. Uh, she had a talk earlier this week. Uh, we use pooled libraries, so we do single sample libraries and then um, pools with 20 individuals, and we use a custom uh, bioinformatic pipeline called CallHap, which was developed by another master's student in my lab. It was published last year in Apps, uh, and there, it's also available on our GitHub page. Check it out. Uh, we, but I can use CallHap to reconstruct the haplotype frequencies 
um, from these pools. I also used flow cytometry. This was performed at Oregon State University by Sabri Elias. Uh, the sampling scheme was that I grabbed leaf tissue from five individuals uh, for each of my populations. Iriophilum is rhizomatous, um, so we had to take care to make sure we didn't sample the same individual twice. And Mooring's populations came in critically here because I had to uh, provide standards for flow cytometry in order to be able to uh, identify diploid and tetraploid peaks. Um, so because I was able to resample his populations, uh, we were able to use those as standards to assign cytotypes from our flow work. And so here are the results from my flow cytometry. Uh, there is no clear pattern, which is very exciting for me. Uh, it is a mosaic of tetraploid, diploid, and even with our limited sampling scheme of five individuals, we were able to detect a mixed ploidy population, uh, which was interesting. And then I also had samples desiccate, which is unfortunate. Uh, I think it's worth noting that their genome sizes, uh, this is the 2C content, are fairly large. So when I get into nuclear markers, um, I have some stuff to look forward to, probably a lot of repetitive regions. Uh, but I should also mention that this map um, is in southern Oregon in the Medford region. Um, and the cluster of populations in the middle there, those are, um, those are around the Table Rocks, which is a beautiful area. Um, but we are sampling a subset of the area that John described. This is a haplotype map. Um, each pi represents one of the pools, um, and the size of the color in each pool represents the frequency at which it occurs in that pool, uh, and each color is a unique haplotype. This map is a little deceptive, um, but I have highlighted a few of the haplotypes that are shared, uh, mostly being the black and the red. Um, but overall, there's actually very little haplotype sharing. Uh, ArcGIS has a hard time generating enough colors uh, because there's 42 haplotypes across my populations in this region. The main take-home message that I, I've learned from this is that there's more haplotype sharing among tetraploid populations than there are diploid, and that tetraploids have both unique haplotypes and also seem to be connected and dispersing. And so I'm now going to highlight a few of these unique tetraploid pop, uh, haplotypes that occur um, across this range. Um, these are Iriophilum seeds. Um, its crown scales are pretty reduced, so we think it's wind dispersed, but I'm not sure how far it would really get. But it seems to be moving, at least within the uh, tetraploid populations. This is my lovely haplotype uh, network. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, it's not going to make sense at the end. Um, here I have highlighted the unique tetraploid haplotypes. These only occur in one pool um, and only in and the pools that were assigned as tetraploids. And so for me, because of the location of these on this network and the SNPs in between them, which are represented by the hashes, um, it to me suggests that I have recurrently formed polyploids um, in different areas. These that I just highlighted are the haplotypes that are shared exclusively between the tetraploid populations. And then these are the unique diploid uh, cytotypes, or haplotypes, sorry. Uh, because of their location on this network, um, I, again, this points to more evidence that these are recurrently formed. They are sometimes occurring at the terminal nodes, uh, preceding a unique tetraploid haplotype. Um, so this, again, adds support to the idea that these polyploids have been recurrently formed. I just highlighted the only shared diploid haplotype, which happens to be in the middle of the network. And here, I have highlighted in orange the shared haplotypes between the tetraploid and diploid populations. So it's probably not that useful for me to be thinking as these, of these pools as being of a single cytotype, because I have multiple lines of evidence that these are likely, uh, this is likely a mosaic of cytotypes across this region. And there's probably mixed ploidy populations throughout that I wasn't able to detect. So the take-home message or what I think was interesting or exciting is that there's 10 haplotypes that are completely unique to tetraploid pools. They only occur in one pool. Um, and that there's five haplotypes that are shared exclusively between tetraploid populations. Here's another visual breakdown of the haplotypes in this region. Um, but again, even with the populations that, have, that I have no data for in terms of their uh, psychology, um, diploids are sharing less haplotypes overall um, than tetraploids are which I think is 
Kind of strange. To understand the connectivity in this region and whether geographic distance could explain genetic distance between these pools, um, or whether there's some environmental uh, variable that could be influencing gene flow, either as a conduit or a resistor, I use a program called Circuitscape, which you can run in ArcGIS. Uh, what you do is you provide Circuitscape predictive layers and then your population points, which serve as focal nodes. And then you scale your layers and set them as either resistances or conduits. Um, and then Circuitscape solves, solves for, um, it generates, it uses circuit theory to calculate resist, uh, resistance values between each of your focal nodes and gives you a resistance matrix. Uh, a resistance matrix. Uh, I can then generate genetic distance matrices between my focal nodes. And I used a multiple regression on distance matrices and a backward selection model to see which of my predicted um, resistance matrices could best explain my genetic distances. I also included geographic distance as well, because you have to. And now I know that genetic distance is not explained by my resistance matrices or my ge or geographic distance, which is again really exciting for me. Uh, not as much for my advisor. Um, <laughs> And population structure, I think, is likely being influenced by this mosaic of cytotypes that I wasn't necessarily able that I wasn't necessarily able to detect um, with my flow cytometry scheme. Interestingly, if I generate two different uh, genetic distance matrices and I split them out by tetraploid and diploid, geographic distance does uh, explain uh, the genetic distance between my tetraploid pools. It does not explain the, dis the difference between diploid. Again, another interesting result. Um, so I, I started to look at the individual uh, makeups of these haplotype pools. And within tetraploid pools, the haplotypes are more closely related to each other um, than the haplotypes within a single diploid pool. So that is to say, the haplotypes are more distantly related in diploids than they are in tetraploids. When taken in the context of John Mooring's work, um, we do know that pollen fertility between Mooring's tetraploid crosses was between 86 and 98 percent, which was significantly more than the diploids. And we also know that when he crossed that progeny with another tetraploid progeny, pollen fertility equaled that or was higher than the parents when the pollen fertility was known. So it seems like reproductive barriers are just dropping off uh, in these tetraploids, and they might be more connected than the diploids in this region. So where does that leave me? With a lot more work to do, I plan to expand my genetic sampling. I want to try to keep looking for mooring sites. They're not always that easy. I want to expand sampling into Washington, the Willamette Valley, and North, Northern California. I'm going to be using GBS to identify the progenitor genomes and also double dip into that data and use it to screen for rare cytotypes, uh, which you can use in a program called GBS Depleti. Uh, and then in a dream world, I would compare the fitness of these independent polyploid lineages in the common garden. I have phenotypic data comparing floral characters and seed production and pollen among populations to see whether there is something about these tetraploid individuals. And then I'm really fascinated about what's going on underground, what explains these distinct root morphologies between varieties of the same species, and are nutrient limitations associated with whole genome duplication events uh, and are vascular mycorrhizal fungi playing a role in facilitating the establishment and maintenance of these mixed cytotype zones. So that's it, and I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me get here, including, uh, including Cruzan uh, and the members of my lab, John Mooring, who's been great, uh, Sabri Elias, and this was funded by NSF Microsystems. Thank you. We have time for one question. <laughs>